It's now my pleasure to introduce the author of the book, Donut Economics, Kate Raworth. Uh, she calls herself a renegade economist. Uh, she teaches at the Environmental Change Institute at Oxford University. So please give Kate Raworth, who's with us via Zoom, a warm hand. Thank you so much for this introduction, and I'm completely delighted to join you. I'm sitting here in London, and I have to very proudly show you, yesterday I was at Extinction Rebellion, and I'm proudly wearing my new <laughs> Extinction Rebellion shirt. So I want to share with you just one big idea today, and that is the shape of progress in the 21st century. And to do that, I need to show you some pictures. So let me share my screen here. Here we go. So yes, I'm going to talk about donuts. Please don't eat them. I'm going to show you the only donut that actually turns out to be good for us. And it's the idea of a donut. It's a picture. So this is what I call the donut of human well-being. Imagine humanity's use of Earth's resources radiating out from the middle of this picture so that the hole in the middle of the picture is where people are left falling short on the essentials of life without the food water, healthcare, education, housing, income that every person has a claim to to meet their needs and rights. We want to leave nobody in that hole, get everyone over the social foundation into the green donut itself. But there is a very big 21st century but because we now know enough earth system science to realize that we cannot use earth resources so much that we push ourselves beyond the outer ring, the ecological ceiling where we cause climate breakdown, we acidify the oceans, we create air pollution, chemical pollution, a hole in the ozone layer, critical collapse of biodiversity. And these, of course, are the nine planetary boundaries first recognized by Earth system scientists, including Johan Rockström and Will Steffen a decade ago. These are Earth's life-supporting systems that make this planet such an extraordinary, unique and delicately balanced home for humanity on which we can thrive. So the goal here is to meet the needs of all people within the thriving living planet that is our home. And the shape of progress that this evokes is so different from last centuries. It's a shape of balance, a dynamism. And what's fascinating to me, once I realize the shape that this invokes of what progress looks like, it invokes a shape that actually is found in so many symbols from ancient cultures, from the Maori Tekarangi, the Zen circle, the Taoist Yin Yang, the Buddhist endless knot, the Celtic double spiral, dynamic balance has somehow been a shape and an image that humanity has chosen again and again and again to represent well being. And in that context, suddenly the Western concept of endless growth is the extraordinary outlier. The 20th century was dominated by a goal measured in the metric of money. And the idea was that it could grow endlessly. You see this GDP line shooting up off, off the page, never stopping. Economics does not talk about that curve bending. The presumption is that it can rise forever. But the 21st century shape of growth will be measured not in the metric of money. It'll be measured in natural and human metrics of whether people have enough food and water and health and education, and whether we have a stable climate and, and fertile soils and a secure ozone layer and ample biodiversity. To me, this is the transformation of our times. So don't talk of progress as growth. Talk of progress as balance, or if you like, health. We understand health in our bodies. It's having enough, but not too much, of food, of water, of oxygen, of exercise, of anything. And we must take that metaphor from the bodily health to planetary health. Now, let me take this idea of health and balance where are we today? Well, we are way out of that balance. And this image shows us the state of humanity today. We, the people of the early 21st century, this is our selfie. All of the red shows the extent in the middle to which people are falling short on the essentials of life. So for example, that red wedge on food shows you 11% of people in the world who don't have enough food to eat every day. It goes to 11% to the middle of the circle. We want to eliminate all the red from the middle of that circle but we already overshot at least four of these planetary boundaries on climate change, on biodiversity loss, land conversion, excessive fertilizer uses, nitrogen and phosphorus loading. So this is our 21st century challenge and the shape of progress is to eliminate this deprivation and excess from both sides at the same time. 
Now I'm showing you a global picture. What happens when we take this down to the level of nations? Some brilliant researchers at Leeds University, and you can see their website there, goodlife.leeds.ac.uk. I really recommend you check out this website. They made 150 <laughs> national donuts. What you can see here, the way they've drawn it is you want to fill the center of the circle in blue without overshooting that green biophysical boundary. So let's start at one end with the country I'm sitting in, the UK. One of the richest countries in the world, we have not even filled our center circle in blue. This should be easy for rich countries, but look, we've got unemployment and inequality. That feels very true from this country right now, but we're massively overshooting our pressure on the planet. Move to the other side, Zambia, barely putting pressure on the planet's systems, but massively falling short on meeting people's needs. And then you've got a country in the middle like China, both falling short on people's, people's needs and already overshooting almost all of those planetary boundaries. Now, let's take these three very, very different countries and put them in a, a, an image of 150 countries. What we've got going on here is the Y axis is achieving those social thresholds, filling the center of the circle in blue. So you want to be up at number 11 where you meet all of people's social needs, but without transgressing any of those biophysical boundaries. Mm -hmm. So the sweet spot is the top left-hand corner where we meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet. And what you can see is no country is anywhere close. <laughs> For me, this redefines the meaning of development. We are all developing countries now. Look at the countries in the bottom left-hand corner. These are what people typically call developing countries. Bangladesh, Indonesia, Pakistan, India. Their challenge has never been done before to meet the needs of all of their people because they're massively falling short. But they cannot take the 20th century path and overshoot all of those planetary boundaries. We know our planet could not take that pressure. They have to turn the corner towards the donut far faster than any country before them. This is unprecedented and they deserve and have the right to support to turn this corner in the way no others have done. But look where we are, the top right-hand corner. We're all up there, Sweden, all of the Nordics, all of Europe, Australia, America, yes, to a broad extent meeting people's needs, but massively overshooting planetary boundaries. And I'm not just talking about resources used in our home countries, I'm talking about the resources used to make all of your smartphones, our laptops, the lights, the carpets, the screens in the room that you're sitting in right now. These are developing countries too, because we have an unprecedented transformational journey we need to go on to continue to meet people's needs, but to come back within the means of our planet. And it's never been done before. And then look at that bottom right-hand corner the so-called emerging economies. You've got China, Egypt, South Africa, Russia, Mexico. They have to both meet people's needs and already come back within planetary boundaries. For me, this single picture redefines the meaning of development. It calls on every country to have humility because I've never been to a country that has the right under this understanding to call itself developed, not one. We are all developing countries now. We need the humility we need the vision to transform ourselves. We need the ambition. And as today's conference is all about, we need the action. That is the one concept I want to share. So don't talk about growth as progress, talk about balance and recognize that every single country in the world is on an unprecedented journey towards it. If you're interested in the seven ways to think like a 21st century economist in my book, you can find them right here in one minute animations online. But I'm gonna stop sharing right now because if any of you have got any questions or thoughts about those images, I'd love to hear them. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. <laughs> uh, let's see. Can you hear me ah, now? Hear Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I, you. you. I just said that your book has been widely read and spread all over the world. Um, I'm curious, we talk about planetary boundaries, and if you look at climate action and climate change as sort of as a leverage that we really have to acknowledge uh, before anything else could be in place, right? So how, what play... What role does this, this climate action play in this transformation that you're portraying here in the donut? Could this be sort of a leverage that really sort of gets us to fix most of the other crucial things too, if we get climate action right? 
Okay, so one of the motivations I understand from Johan Rockström and other scientists who drew those nine planetary boundaries, mm -hmm. one of their motivations to, to drawing them was to say we cannot, in this era of understanding the holistic dynamism of our planet, we cannot take a single issue and focus only on that, disregarding impacts on all those other planetary boundaries, because we could fix the climate crisis in a really foolish way. We could fix the climate mm -hmm. crisis with technologies that destroy biodiversity. Absolutely that undermine water supplies. So we have to think, come up with solutions for climate change while respecting mm -hmm. all of those planetary boundaries, but also while respecting human rights mm -hmm. and a massive redistributional justice. So social and ecological justice are deeply intertwined. It sounds like it makes it harder, but if you set out mm -hmm. single-mindedly to tackle one issue, let's just do climate change and everything else later, we will not get very far. And of course, we need clear plans of action. The Club of Rome has a fantastic climate emergency 10 point plan that sets out very clear plans of action. Many issues that are being discussed here today, and I recommend people to have a look at those. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kate Raworth. And let's just tell you too, before you go offline, we have 1,000 viewers uh, online on YouTube right now. So this is powerful stuff. Thank you so much for your wonderful work. My pleasure. Great to join you.